Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you have ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. I am your host, Patty Porter. My guest hosts, Dina Zometa and Stephen Kotev, along with our guest experts, will share our experiences, raise your awareness, and give you food for thought. We will share with you problem-solving strategies, no matter what your situation is, at work, with neighbors or friends, family, and with partners. Tune in or join in the conversation every Tuesday evening. Good evening, listeners. Tonight's episode, Money Doesn't Grow on Trees, Resolving Money Disputes with Family, Friends, and Neighbors, is the third episode for this month's series focused on sources of common fights, misunderstandings, and disagreements. Do you and your spouse spend differently? fighting with siblings about inheritance, can't decide how to split costs with a neighbor, going out with friends who don't pay their fair share. Money is a common source of disagreement. Tonight we hear from Linda Grison, who has led consensus decision-making for more than 40 years. She opened Mediation Works in 2007 and has helped hundreds of people cooperation. Linda is the president of the Montana Mediation Association. She is a certified mediator with family designation and has earned advanced practitioner status with the Association for Conflict Resolution and Academy. I am your guest host, Tracy Colbert King, and tonight we invite you to participate in our live Twitter feed using hashtag conflict chat. Welcome to the program, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. We are excited to have you on the program this evening. Can you tell the listeners, who is Linda Grison? Well, mediation is my encore career. Like you said, I was leading consensus, nonprofit consensus decision-making for 40 years. And during all that time, I was actually running a mobile bicycle repair shop. So what I think of as mediation, it was a natural progression from the consensus decision making and I tell people I'm still fixing things my fingernails are just a lot cleaner (laughs) I imagine when you were working in the repair shop you saw quite a bit of conflict when it came to customers and daily interactions and things along those lines Actually, I was becoming a really cheap marriage counselor because I was mobile, so I was at people's homes. It might be getting dark, and they'd be telling me a tale of woe, and I would sit there and listen. And uh uh-huh, and I was a stranger. I would be gone in an hour, and they could unload whatever burdens life had for them. And do you have time for one more bicycle? Oh, sure. And I would, you know, just be working away and turning (laughs) wrenches and... (laughs) <laughs> Truly wheels, and um, I realized I was pretty good at this because it was such a common experience. Just had that ability to really listen and understand and give them that outlet for them to share whatever yes. was bothering bothering them. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful, and it, and it sounds like you landed where you should have. <laughs> yes, I'm very delighted, and I never plan on retiring. As long as I have a brain, um, I'll be mediating. Yeah, thank you so much. When it comes to money disputes, what are some of the common misunderstandings or disagreements? Money is something, since it's a common exchange and we all understand its worth, it's a stand-in for lots and lots of different Uh, issues. It's a substitute. When people in a divorce are fighting about money, my guess it's about something else. When families dividing, it may be a pearl necklace is the only thing that they're inheriting from mom, and there may be a dozen kids. Money can be what people, what is a stand-in for lots and lots of other issues and hurt feelings and unmet needs. 
if we can't get what we want, at least we might be able to get some money. And we have so many different values about money. We have so many different cultural understandings about money that vary with people across the income strata and from culture to culture. We just spend money differently. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting the way that you pose it, that money is a band-aid for issues, because we see that every day in our court system is people are coming in and they're suing for a certain amount of money when in reality what brought them there wasn't a money issue. It was a relationship issue. It was a contraction contractor issue, maybe a disagreement on uh, mm-hmm. services that were going to be provided, things along those lines, and uh, to help them move on. Mm-hmm. And it means so many different things. One example I use, let's say a couple is fighting over a credit card bill. Part one of the real interests of one of the parties might be Present in my family are a way that we show love. I'm going to put money on the credit card bill. The other person may be, in my family, security means having money in the bank and being able to pay off the credit card every month. It might mean I am feeling real insecure right now and so I want pretty shiny things that I'm putting on the credit card. The other person Uh may be thinking, I have a long-term goal, and if we're buying pretty shiny things, we'll need to put off, say, investing in a new car. Instead of fighting over you're right, you're wrong, if you can get to the underlying issues, the interests behind them, you can address the problem much more effectively. And some of those issues are value-driven. Uh, the belief that we're, even that, the way that we were raised with that disagreement example Absolutely. where you had the couples fighting over money. Uh, one family was raised that, you know, money was a was a way to sustain them. And the other is money is a way you save and you um, continue to better yourself. And money is a gift. So there's just different ways that we view this culturally and also from family to family. It, It's just different. It's absolutely different. It's why couples in marriages, that's the most common dispute, is ostensibly about money. I believe it's about other things. And we could save ourselves a lot of heartache by getting to the other things. And, you know, I, 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 I guess I'd like to say one thing just... Comparing, I live in Montana, a, a, a large American Indian population. Here is a here is a culture that values how much you can give away. Uh, traditionally, the chief is the poorest person in in the tribe because they are giving away as much as they can. That's how you gain status. Pair that with an Anglo culture or as much as you can accumulate is how you get status. Put those two together and, well, everyone knows what happened. But that's Uh part of it is a culture that generosity is valued and accumulation is valued can really butt up against each other. So some of the disputes where it involves money really comes down to an understanding of how each individual or each party views money. Absolutely. What does it mean to you? Mm-hmm. And what did it mean in your family? And we carry that through our lives. It, it uh, really works that way. Um, that's why the underlying issues are so important. Um, another is, is uh, just think of two neighbors. Maybe somebody through some sort of negligence caused by somebody, um, flooding happened on somebody's property. That might have to do with self-responsibility. The issue might be uh, respect for property. It might be, well, your barking dogs have kept me awake for the last four years, so I can't get them to shut up, so I want you to pay my landscaping bill. Um, 
because of the flood that you caused in my yard. Um, Or it might be, I can't get respect or fairness or an apology from you, so I'm going to be asking for money. And I think that's what people take to court. Mm -hmm. When an apology would be much easier, would be much cheaper. And in that, I hear that it's not only the values and beliefs, it's uh, what your sense of fairness is and what your sense of respect is. So there's a lot yes. of moving targets that are going on when it comes to disagreements mm-hmm. and money is involved. Mm-hmm. And what we agree on is money can fix things and we understand what money is worth mm-hmm. because it's a common language. And maybe you don't know the language of apology but you certainly can pay me a thousand dollars. And also, yeah. if you don't have an understanding of how to apologize or how to move forward without putting that monetary um, price on what you're looking for, it's hard to even communicate that. So then, that's when you do go to court and you say. Uh, so-and-so did this, and uh, this is what I feel is owed to me, when that party may not even know that you went to court and you filed a case against them because you don't know how to communicate with them the issues that you're having or what it is that you need to be able to move forward. Yes. Lots of personal injury cases could be settled by, I apologize. I apologize that something I did caused you inconvenience, grief, pain, and whatever else the consequences were. Those are powerful words. And people want that acknowledgement. I know that when I'm doing mediations for small claims cases, um, if the parties cannot apologize to one another while I'm having an individual meeting with each, each side, I'll just say something like, I want to acknowledge that you feel you you see yourself as an honest, upstanding citizen and you were not treated fairly here. I want to acknowledge that and apologize on the other party's behalf. And that means, makes all the difference in the world. If the other party can't apologize, if someone else does the apology in their place, they can relax and make it easier to come to resolution, make it easier to come to a more cooperative decision-making place. Apologies are that golden nugget and conflict that are powerful and can make major shifts in the whole dynamic of a conflict or the relationship of the parties that are in conflict And what can be challenging is individuals don't know how to go about doing that. And it's a a hard thing to do to say, I'm sorry. That's just, Mm -hmm. it's easier to put a Band-Aid on it and put a monetary value on there instead of saying, Mm -hmm. you know, I I apologize and I acknowledge um, that I hurt you. I acknowledge that you're upset. I acknowledge that we're in a disagreement. But that acknowledgement is mm-hmm. usually what parties need to just be able to move forward. Yes. Yes. So besides an apology, I think it'd be wise to talk to some, about some other tools that uh, people can take to these kinds of conversations. And I have a three-step process that I call IRL, I-R-L. The I stands for looking at one's own intention. What do I want out of this conversation? Say with the neighbor over the flooding. Is my intention to let the neighbor know that they are an insensitive jerk? Well, if that is my intention and I act on that, I'm not going to get very much of what I want. If I can take that lower into what do I really want? What do I really want? Not just to say what's wrong with them, or how wrong they are. But what is it that I want? Because I feel your negligence caused the flooding in my yard, I would like you to pay the $1,000 landscaper bill to, uh, 
to repair the damage is far clearer than you are a dirty, rotten son of a gun. You will get far more of what you want if you can really pay attention to the I, to pay attention to your own intention. And think about what is the best way to convey this to the other person. The second part is request is turning complaints into requests. Many of us have been trained in the language of complaints. We know what's wrong with the world. It's like grown-up whining. It is far more powerful to turn that complaint into a behavioral request. I can complain about you about my destroyed flower bed, or I can say, will you please make up the damage, pay for the damage that you caused. What's going to get you more of what you want? A clear request. Another one um, I use is let's just say uh, you're loaning your car to somebody and they return it with an empty gas tank and you have to pay to fill it. There's another money issue. You can say, you can complain about you returned it on empty and I had to pay to fill it up. Or you can say, you're sure, sure, use my car. Are you willing to return it with a full tank? Can you commit to that? It's a very clear request. And the third one is listen. Have you been listening to the same argument over and over and over again? When we humans do that, it's often because we haven't felt heard. And acknowledging what someone is saying doesn't mean you have to agree with them at all. It just means that you understand them. So you can say... um, A good opener for one of these negotiating conversations is, it sounds like what you want is this. Do I have that right? And then listen to the response. Sometimes people are very unclear about what they want. And so they're they're just throwing out complaints and accusations and name calling. And you can interrupt that by saying, I think you're wanting this. Do I have that right? I think I'm hearing you say this. Tell me if I'm correct. And even if you have guessed completely wrong, it helps people move into the thinking part of their brain and think, oh, no, I don't want that. I want this. That's what I've been saying. Well, they may not have been saying that in any way, shape, or form. It helps move to a subject control conversation rather than one that's all about emotion and ineffective communication. So I call that IRL, I-R-L, intention, requests, and listen. What I really like about that is it's very easy and simple. Well, what is your intention? Uh, What is it that you want or that you need? And when you're in that moment, listen so you can make sure that you are not only hearing correctly and also so the other party can feel that they've been heard and acknowledged. And when we are heard, that opens up and understood, that opens up brain space for cooperative decision-making and real solutions rather than what is often a shouting match. Those are some great tools and strategies for our listeners to take into their daily lives. I just want to remind listeners that you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program, and we are chatting with Linda Gryson, and tonight's program focuses on what's behind money disputes with neighbors, families, friends, and couples. Linda, if someone wants to find themselves in a money dispute, uh, and we previously discussed some of the strategies, but let's say that they tried the IRL and they just were not successful, what are some of the next steps for them? There's, there's lots of options. There's always wise people in our communities that you can go talk with or a good friend to think about your options. Now, what's important is when you're talking with this friend is you're not using the time to complain about what's wrong with the other person, but rather here's what my intention is. What, how can I request what I want in a way the other can hear? Am I really hearing what they want? 
Can I empathize with them? What might be um, driving um, what they're telling me? So finding another person. That can be a family. It can be a friend, professional mediators. We often do conflict coaching where we help people figure out these things and approach a conflict on their own. Or we help people sit down at a table together and reframe what they're saying, uncover their true interests, and help them find a solution that will work for both of them. We often ask a question like, so both of you have a need for security. Person A, you might do it by having nice things. Person B, you might have it by having a nice savings account. How can the two of you meet your mutual needs for security in a way that's going to work for both of you? And that silence allows people to move into a place for a proposal, for something that is really going to work for them and help them rethink their spending and saving habits in a way that's productive. It's important if you're working with a mediator that, you know, there's some types of mediation that work really well that is really about the money. It is about a legally defensible agreement. If one person's asking for $1,000, you may settle on 500 And that will be the solution. You split the baby. There are others that in mediation world is called facilitated mediation. And that's where people are in the same room and they are coming up with their own best solution. If the mediator has an opinion, it's irrelevant. They are helping the two of them communicate. And this is what saves relationships with the sister, with the spouse, the neighbor across the fence. Because you're communicating in a way that meets both your needs. Even if you're very, very different people. That's great. So there are a lot of options for individuals who are currently finding themselves in the dispute and some of the strategies that we previously discussed didn't completely work for them. There's talking to a friend, talking to a neighbor, talking to a coworker, and they can even use the IRL model. Uh, so what came to me when we were having this conversation was the idea of role-playing. Mm-hmm what my intention yes. is here. I really want to mm-hmm. make sure my request is clear. I really want to be able to listen. And can you check on maybe my nonverbals when we have this practice conversation? Uh, can you see mm-hmm. how I'm taking in what you're saying? Can you give me some feedback on those things? So to really have some coaching, which is one of the other points, it's not necessarily with a professional, but it's with a friend, a neighbor, someone that you feel comfortable mm-hmm. with that will give you feedback and may know your mannerisms and have a sense of those little triggers that you may have when you have difficult conversations. I believe that before any important negotiation where people are not represented by somebody who is a professional negotiator, that it's a very good idea to role play that first and to really plan out a strategy and a fallback and know your line in the sand and know um, where your wiggle room is and, under, and, and to think about what the other side wants and what they might give up that is of low importance to themselves and what you might or you might be able to move in a way that is least harmful. And I believe that's very, very helpful. Unfortunately, most of us, when we talk to a friend, we're still speaking in the language of complaint. And that does not solve a problem. It is far more useful to say, help me think about this. Help me move forward. Help me get more of what I want. That will get you far more than having somebody empathize with your tale of woe. It's solution-focused. So that's important is to go into that conversation that you have with your friend, your coworker, your significant This is not a complaint. This is us having a conversation to help 
me get to a better place mm-hmm. to accomplish X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to badmouth person X. I'm trying to understand him or her. And friends can be very insightful uh, and helpful in that. And good friends are kind enough to tell us our own shortcomings if we're open to hearing them. And that's key, too, when you're having that conversation is having that openness, that willingness to role play this out, to change your mindset and also to get some feedback from a person who you care about and who cares about you and wants you to be able mm-hmm. to resolve this conflict in a constructive way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And some of us do well talking out loud. Others of us like to write. Others are better thinking on our own. So whatever uh, whatever a person's preferred plan is, a way of operating then you might want to think by yourself, you might want to talk to a friend, or you may want to write it out to get that personal understanding. There's lots of ways to move down the road. So the key here is there are a lot of options out there for individuals when they feel like they're stuck and they're in conflict, and they can reach out to a friend, they can write it out, they can receive conflict coaching, mediation, and uh, just try to pursue other avenues when you're feeling like you are in a conflict and you just don't know what to try. There are options out there for them. There are lots of options. Usually, Usually what we like to do, Linda, is give our listeners an assignment for the week had a really robust yeah. conversation today, and I just want to see what do you what would you like to give the listeners today after listening to this program? Well, we humans are pretty good at irritating one another, so I would <laughs> I would add that. And so there is there are lots of opportunities to have a different kind of conversation. I would ask that whether it's a money dispute or something else that the next time somebody finds themselves in um, in a disagreement with somebody, that they think of Earl, that they stop and think about their intention, that they think about making a request, and that they listen to the other person and see if that gets them more of what they want. And then analyze afterward. Did I like what I did? Would I want to change anything? And then repeat, because there are so many opportunities. As long as there are people in the world, we will have disagreements. Exactly. That's very true. And to go into those disagreements thinking with Earl of the intention, the request, and then thinking about how you were in that moment afterwards to do that self-evaluation, that self-assessment can really help you learn and grow. And it's not just learning and growing. This is how we get what we want. This is how we become more effective people. Um, It may be immediately satisfying to let the neighbor know that they're an insensitive jerk. It will be even more satisfying if you get what you want and your landscaping bill taken care of or the barking dogs become quiet. That's the change that really matters. Far more than being able to tell somebody off. And get a chance to gloat about being right. Um, Because you will be paying for it down the road with a continued dispute and a relationship that's not working. I think maybe what I'd like to do is end by commenting that improving communication helps us understand and be understood. It gets us far more of what we want, fewer hard feelings and a whole lot less drama. It improves relationships and makes them stronger. If you have trouble, and if you have trouble doing this on your own, talk to somebody. Get help, whether that's a a friend, a family member, or a professional. We can all help transform 
conflict into solutions, into cooperation. I believe it's possible to make two peace two people at a time. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you enjoyed the program. You can find all of our podcasts archived to listen at your convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. You can also become a Facebook fan of Conflict Connections or Twitter me at TX Conflict Coach.